Hello everybody, it's Alex once again from Remote Work Life. Welcome and thanks for joining me. And today I have, well, yet another special guest. As I mentioned to you before, we only bring the best guests onto the Remote Work Life podcast. And today I have with me Job van der Voort. And Job is the CEO and co-founder of Remote. Uh, your previously worked as a neuroscientist, believe it or not, before leaving academia to become the VP of product at GitLab, which as you may or may not know, is the world's largest all remote company. He hired uh, talent in 67 different countries. So that, wow, that's immense. So we're gonna learn a little bit about that today. Yob is also a highly sought after presenter. He speaks on topics relating to scaling a remote first startup, remote culture, and the future of work. So, yeah, ideal guest to have on the podcast. Job also has two kids and 500 hobbies. And, you know, I need to ask Job about that because 500 hobbies, I mean, puts me to shame. But, Job, thank you for joining me today and you're welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Alex. So welcome. So welcome. So, Yo, I've been wait, waiting quite a while for this moment as we've, um, I think you started uh, remote around about 2019, around right. about the same time that I started the Remote Work Life podcast. Um, and I suppose quite frankly, it's exploded in terms of interest, in terms of uptake. Um, I just want to say, as I said, thank you for joining me, but Tell me, um, how did it, you know, how did you get to this point? Did you envision yourself in this role when you were at GitLab, for example? Yeah, funny story. I, um, I was doing a different job before GitLab where I met Sid, the CEO. And he asked me, oh, do you want to join me at, at GitLab? And I was like, yeah, I'll join you. But I, I kind of want to start my own company. So I'll join you for a year. And then I'm going to leave. Uh, and that year turned into five years. So, so in a way, I did envision running my own company, at least, because that was, was explicitly my goal, even by the time that I joined GitLab. And like we, uh, between Sid and I, we always had an agreement that I would join um, and then I would leave. And that was always the agreement. And so, I mean, I stayed for five years and I told him, look, now's the time. I told you this was going to happen. Uh, now I'm going to go. Um, so in a way, yes. I mean, I, I would never imagine myself, you know, leading such a large, um, uh, maybe too early to tell, but relatively successful company. So <laughs> no. And I think, well, you obviously had, like you said, you had that goal in your mind. So it sounds like, I mean, and from some of the interviews I've listened to you, you sound like Maybe, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, a bit of a risk here, but you sound like you're the kind of person who really knows what they want and you, you go after it and you plan out what you want and you approach things from that perspective. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, no, you're right. I, I've been always very clear on what I want, although that thing has changed many times. You know, I don't know what I want to do, you know, after remote, if they kick me out. But um, no, I've been always incredibly stubborn about what I want to do. And I've always just gone straight for that. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, it's a good point. It's a good guess. It's a good guess. But no, um, and we're going to talk, I mean, for those of you listening today, we're going to really dig into, um, obviously, we're going to be talking about remote work. We're going to be talking about asynchronous work as well and working asynchronously within your teams. But as you all know, I like to get, get under the skin, really, and really understand the people behind the businesses. And... To that, as I was saying before, we I listened to a few of Job's uh, uh, interviews, and yeah, how was your time? What I suppose I wanted to know is how was your time at um, GitLab? What did it teach you? Uh, <laughs> a lot of things. It, it was it was five years, so it's a lot of time, and you know, it, the company grew really fast. The first year at GitLab. We were initially not even planning to raise any VC money, and we thought we're just going to bootstrap this. Um, and a year later, we were in Y Combinator. We went through that whole experience. And um, so uh, a lot. I, I learned how, to, I think the most fundamental thing is, is that I, I learned that you can do this. You can build a truly distributed team of people all over the world and build a very successful company. And I think in a lot of ways, um, a company that, you know, for one, breaks the mold, but also does many things significantly better 
and not necessarily because of choice, but more because as an emergent property of the fact that we didn't have any offices, we ended up hiring from all over the world and ended up with a very diverse team. I think that in and of itself has so many advantages for any kind of organization. And it's such a great forcing function to better practices like asynchronous work and uh, many others uh, that, you know, I think that laid the foundation on what I was going to do next, right? Like, I think the reason that remote exists is because I saw the problem we faced, the problems we faced at GitLab and are trying to solve that at remote, but also because I believe that, okay, you can build these kind of organizations um, and I want to help more people create organizations like this. And in doing so, you know, give more people the opportunity to work for those kind of organizations. So um, yeah, a whole lot. GitLab taught me a whole lot. <laughs> I don't want to say everything, but a whole lot. No, nice summary. But, uh... Wait, what, what's the biggest takeaway from you from, from GitLab? What's the biggest thing you've probably learned from your time there? I mean, it's, it's what I said. It's the fact that you can do this, that you can build this truly distributed company and that, that it has massive advantages, right? Like that is easily the best one. I think when we were building GitLab, we often faced people being skeptic about the fact that we were fully remote and fully distributed. It was seen as a very you know, controversial thing to do, something that was very rare and exceptional and like only certain kind of, the, the questions were always the same, like, oh, only certain kind of people or you don't collaborate or it's just because you're building this kind of company or um, a million others, really. Like, for example, we knew at GitLab, that, oh, we were not a good acquisition target because we didn't have an office in San Francisco. So it would be very hard to acquire us. All of those things, you know, they seemed super controversial at the time, but while in GitLab, it seemed so incredibly obvious that this was working. Yeah, that was the takeaway. No, that's, that's, that's cool. And it's, you're remote now, you started remote and everything seems to be going really well and you're hiring and growing different entities across the world. Is, I mean, in terms of uh, remote, how, how are things going at remote at the moment for you? Uh, I, I think pretty well. Uh, it's running companies really, really hard. And um, remote grew from, I think, a year ago, we had 40 or 50 employees. Today, we have 500 something. So that's, that's a lot. It's really hard to build some kind of structure organization and to make people even understand what their job is when you're growing this incredibly fast. And so... The reason that we grew so fast is because there's so much demand, right? We have thousands of customers. And so, yeah, those two things together, that's really difficult. Um, I think from, from the outside, and if you look at the numbers, we are quite a successful company. Um, I think on the inside, sometimes it feels like everything else on fire, but it's also a little bit the way it goes to the startup. I think generally everybody that works at remote is working really hard to build something really, really good. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would give us an eight, an eight out of 10 so far. That's okay. And the thing I, I, I've noticed about you, you're very, um, are you the kind of person as well who just really absorbs challenges and just takes things as they come? Um, or are you somebody who just really foresees what might happen and can prepare for those things? Well, I think a bit of both, right? In a startup, the reality is, and for any, any problem set, most of the things that you think are, are complex you figure out in advance and real hard things you, you encounter while you're doing it, right? And I, the same goes with the startup. So I had all these grand visions about particular parts of how we were going to do things. And some of them really panned out and, and some of them were still very much building. Uh, and I first saw them years ago and others I had never imagined that those were complex things that we would you know, trip over six times <laughs> before we, we were able to fix them. So. You know, I, I would say a bit of both, which I think is necessary in a startup. You need to have a long-term vision, but you also need to be able to deal with the day-to-day. -day. And what about, because I mean, we in different podcasts, I hear you talking a lot about, about remote, but what about you and your career? I mean, you've talked through some of the, cha basically some of the challenges you've had so far with remote, but what about your career? I mean, for you, what have been the personal challenges that you've had in your career that you've had to, to overcome? Um, I don't know. I, I, I always like to say that I'm not a very good example or story to listen to in that sense, because as, as, as we were saying early on, is that I like challenges and I overcome them by force of will. <laughs> so I don't feel like I, you know, 
I think I've had struggles like everybody else, but I, I never felt like, wow, this was like a major hard thing to come out to, to get over. You know, as, as I was saying, I think it's really hard to build a company. I think that this is probably the biggest challenge so far, career wise. Fair enough. And it's a nice challenge to have to have that, that success. You're in, is it 67 um, entities now, you said, right? No, but we, we are around 60 or so that we, we have right now, and it's, it's growing really fast. I think we'll be around 80 before the end of the year. So we're adding a lot these last two months at least. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know about Remote, just, could you give us just like an overview of, of what Remote is all about? I mean, I know, but I don't want to bore people with my <laughs> So you, please, you tell us. It's very simple. If you have a company and you want to hire someone in a different country than where you have that company, we can solve that for you. We take care of payroll, we take care of compliance, taxes, and anything else that comes with it. That is what Remote does. And that's what we solve. And we solve that in a million different ways. We solve that for contractors, for uh, direct employees, or employees that are employed through us, through an employer record kind of structure, um, any any kind of form, really. Um, and any anything that comes with that as well. Payroll, benefits, but also you know more complicated things than that. Um, we solve all of that, which is a lot, and it's really, really complex. But fundamentally, it just solves that one problem. You want to hire someone in a different country? We, we solve that. And you do that by API. How does that work then? Because I mean, I, I, I get the, the concept, but you do that via API. Can you, can you explain that a bit more? Um, no. So... The way we do it is by lots of sweat and tears. It's uh, you have to figure out, like, let's say I want to hire Jane in Portugal, right? I have to then go into Portugal, figure out what are the lo local labor laws like? How do I employ someone? How do I run payroll locally? So we do this for every country in the world. And in doing so, we have to build software to automate the processes involved with onboarding Jane and all their other friends. So we build all this software, which is this really complicated stack of software that does a million different things. Um, and we make it available directly through our customers so that you can just sign up and you don't have to talk to someone, but rather you're just guided through this onboarding thing. Um, or we make available APIs so that if you are a partner of ours, you can offer the same kind of functionality. So you can say, well, you can employ people through us, but really through remote. And this, there's this API available that we then use to integrate with remote. That is really what that is. Amazing. Like you said, it's got so many different moving parts, but you've managed to package it in such a way that and that you've been able to scale so quickly and must have a you must have a wonderful team. Um, <laughs> I do, yeah, yeah. And in terms of the, uh, did you did you and I mean I know obviously everybody's been forced to work remotely, um, and some are liking it some others aren't and it's you know you're you're having lots of clients on board did you did you anticipate the sort of uh, uh the success that you that you're having now did you anticipate the numbers no i didn't <laughs> i also didn't anticipate COVID. <laughs> so which i think is a major boon and like one of the main ways that this massive shift to remote work happened right um, so no i didn't anticipate it we we started seeing it when COVID started happening it was very clear that this was going to be an accelerating trend, right? So when COVID happened, it's not that there was immediately a boom of demand. The demand was already there and we were already serving part of that. But I mean, we we weren't actually because we only opened the doors after COVID, but nonetheless, <laughs> we were anticipating the demand that we were speaking with potential customers for a long time. Um, but what we did anticipate is that once people start working remotely they start to realize that oh i can just hire internationally so instead of just hiring you know in my country or even in, an, in a neighborhood in which i have an office um, and now i think we're starting to see that demand realize right now you start to see more and more jobs opening that have location anywhere and that is that is what we were anticipating you know a year year and a half ago um, but but not before that absolutely not no i think you know i, I thought we would be successful i knew that it was this was like an interesting market. I knew we could be successful in, in, in this. I didn't anticipate us within two years to have a company with 500 employees. No. It's incredible. It's just, it's beyond sort of like, <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. That's the only word I could think of right now. And obviously being, you know, fast forwarding to where you are now to 500 uh, employees, leadership obviously comes into it. You know, you, you as not just a, a founder, but 
there's, there has to be so many facets to your the way you work and who you are in order to, to have a successful company um, with that scale. What's the what would you say is probably the most significant or most important leadership lesson that you that you've learned? Oh, good question. I don't know. I think it's hire great people and give them the space to be great. I think that's one of the most important things. You'll find that if you hire someone that's ambitious and hungry, as they say, right, wants to get shit done, and you give them the space to do so, they all they they tend to be excellent people and they tend to do really really well. And I think that's how I am as a leader. I tell all my reports that you you know you have to play ground to yourself. You get to do your best work. I will make sure you're unblocked. You have every anything you need, money, people, whatever else. Um, just show show me your best work, and that tends to work out really really well. <laughs> okay, the reason I'm laughing is because I've, I've worked in recruitment for for a number of years myself, and you, you said just hire the best people. Yeah, that yeah, that's the the end game. You want to hire the best people, but I think the principles of recruiting and hiring people, yeah, they're they're, they're pretty much there. They're set. In, we're not set in stone, but it's pretty straightforward to follow those principles. But it's easier to sort of like the practice of recruiting and hiring the, the right people is is the challenge. What's the uh, the remote way or the job way of, of hiring people and you know making sure that they're aligned with with what you're looking at? Yeah, I, I think it starts a little bit earlier than that. I think you have to create a company culture or a place where like talented people will want to work, right? To so create a really safe, inclusive environment is a really important one. I think it's, it's important to almost everybody that I think is great. So uh, that's a pretty good start, right? Like, and even if you want to hire like a white guy from San Francisco, creating an inclusive environment is also going to do better for them, right? Like that's a really good place to start. And then you create an atmosphere that is pleasant for them as well. Like if you're a micromanager, that's that they will get that sense from you, from your organization in talking with your organization. Like nobody wants to work for a micromanager. So that's where it starts. And then, you know, like there's no such thing as the best person in any given thing. One way you're definitely not going to find it is by looking at someone's CV and counting the years of experience they have in X or Y, right? Like it's not how you find someone great at all. It's quite the opposite. Um, I think you're going to find someone that's incredibly rigid and very like expecting a particular thing if they uh, spend a lot of time. So I think really what you're looking for is like, what is the kind of person that matches our organization, matches what I like to, the type of person that I like to work with, Right, and this is often described as cultural, but it's also you know how people select people that look like themselves. So I'm careful not to use that. But how you know looking for that person that matches well with you and with with the greater organization, and then of course has some rel relevant experience. And what I find is that one of the best predictors if someone is successful at remote, not going to make any judgments at other companies, but at remote, is someone that is very kind, hardworking, and just very smart. And then experience in the relevant place in which you know we're hiring them into, it's definitely important and it's going to help them a lot, but it's not the solution to the hiring fit, right? The fit is going to be fully determined by all the other things, assuming they have the experience that they need to be able to do the job. Um, and that's how you find, uh, hire the best people. And so that means sometimes, you know, we have people that don't have many years of experience in a particular function, but because now they finally have, you know, they're getting the trust, they're getting the, the space to do the best work. That is why they succeed at remote. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think a very large part, if not my entire team is exactly people like that. That I mean, I've never been CEO. So far, it's going pretty well. So <laughs> I that, you know, like, I, that's what I was thinking about. It's like, I, I'm also new to this job. So like, let's all figure it out together. I don't necessarily have to hire people that can redo the thing that have, they have been doing in the past. Love that, uh, that principle, love that uh, way of looking at recruitment. And I think, I think it's, I've interviewed many uh, people who work remotely, I've spoken to quite so many people, especially those who hire and make the decisions. And I think it's very different. The way that remote companies hire, the, 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 the tactics might be similar to, to sort of office-based hiring, but the thought process is completely, it's far, it's far removed. It's so much more, it's like you said, it's, it's more about the person. The CV is not, 
people are still so hung up on resumes and CVs um, and don't look beyond the CV. And I think that's something that I can categorically say that remote businesses do better than any other. So yeah, I love that, love it. Okay, so one, one of the biggest challenges actually I come across here, um, and in fact myself when I was, uh, well, I worked remotely myself and there was a point where I became very um, isolated in my career um, and perhaps got so focused on work that I didn't, I didn't reach out as much as I should do. I just, just got my head down and did my work and that was it. Yeah. Then I realized, you know, I've got to do a bit more. I've got to be a bit more sort of out there. I've got to speak to people and I've got to continue. I like to continue to learn. And that, that my inquisitive nature is what really sort of took me to, to that place where I was learning a bit more. But what's your approach to not just yourself, continue your own development, um, but also for your team as well? What's your approach to you know, learning and development to keep moving forward? Um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it, it really depends on like what part of the organization, what kind of person you're you're talking about, right? Like, I think it's very different for the people that report up to me directly are all executives with a very different kind of you know path than you know an individual contributor in the organization. I think you know as an organization as a whole, there's a few things you want to do. One is you want to make sure that um, for any given role, there's a career path available to them, right? Whatever that might be. And it might be, you know, moving up in the organization. So becoming a manager or a manager of managers or moving, you know, horizontally to a different function or just at like a different seniority, right? And all of those have to be available to anybody in the organization. If there isn't, they're going to leave eventually because they want to make steps up in their career. And like, and they, they also want that recognition. Like I am growing and I'm getting better. So I want to, actually move up in roles. So that's one, which is like setting the framework. Um, and then you want to make sure that everybody has a manager that understands that part of their role is to help their reports grow and like grow in their function and grow in their capabilities and how good they are. And that, you know, and, and, and wants them to succeed and can help them in succeeding. Uh, and, and like, again, this is an organizational structure trick, but like if the people have too many reports, they can't do that, right? Which is, more acceptable, but not less unacceptable, but more acceptable higher in the organization. Um, but definitely, you know, if you are an individual contributor, your manager should have time for you. Like they, they should have time for you. And then beyond that, as an organization, you want to provide opportunities to learn and to develop yourself. And it can be in all sorts of ways, right? Like both internally as well as externally uh, through making available budgets, through coaching them to become leaders, for example, by offering courses and whatever else and internal uh, things with that um, we have a learning and development uh, team side of remote so so growing and you know the company is not at all so um, but yeah I think I think it's a combination of all of those things I think that is that is what is most important that there's many different ways that you do this that you support people's growth within an organization and, and sometimes outside of that mm -hmm. no, I like that and talking about the the, the team obviously um, Continued learning is, is an important thing. Um, I'm sure you you hire people who probably work remotely. Do you hire generally people who have not worked remotely, have not worked worked asynchronously before as well? Or yeah, we don't care. We don't care about that. We just hire whoever we want to hire. I mean, yeah. if you can communicate well, you can work remotely. Mm -hmm. That's it. I don't, I don't feel really strongly about it. Yeah. Otherwise, one, you're just gonna shoot yourself in the foot. And two, why why block the opportunity to otherwise great people? It's not like they have an office to go to. <laughs> so yeah. they have no choice. Yeah. Uh, and it's not to say that like people won't struggle. They might struggle, but we provide sufficient resources and coaching. And again, like we have a good structure in the organization to make sure that you can succeed. Um, and there are resources for you to succeed. And then yeah, if it still doesn't work out for whatever reason, that's unfortunate, but also luckily very rare. And one of those things that maybe people ha have to adapt to, and I think more and more in the future is, is working asynchronously. Um, and for you, why, because I mean, this is something I, I think obviously it's gonna, it's gonna grow. It's, it's people talking about it a lot more now, obviously than they, they used to talk about it. Um, people like yourself, you're the, I, I guess I've seen as go-to people 
now in terms of talking about it and advising on it. But in your view, why should why should leaders care about adopting async work practices? Well, if they don't, their businesses will fail. So I think that's a pretty good reason why they should care yeah. about it. Well, the reality yeah. is is very simple. If you if you don't pay attention to this, if you don't start working asynchronously, if you are a remote company or even if you're not, um, you're going to be in meetings all day. That's it, right? Like it's. I think asynchronous work is is or like working asynchronously is presented as this like magical thing that's going to solve all your problems. But the reality is, it's just you know a few good standards around how you should communicate uh, that help you also avoid meetings and that help you avoid overhead or, or completely unnecessary, which is sort of implied in overhead overhead um, that you know everybody would be happy to go without. And so, yeah, you have no choice as a business leader, unless everybody wants to be in meetings all day, which no one wants to be, you have to start working asynchronously. Wait, I don't know if I answered your question. I, 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 I did say what I wanted to say. <laughs> no, it does, it does. And I, the thing is that I think lots of people, I mean, I, I'm looking at my, my peer group now and people who perhaps are not used to working um, remotely, it's almost there's still a there's a block i guess a mindset block i think in the sense that people still feel as though if they are in a meeting that they're doing things they're getting things done <laughs> and therefore they they add more and more meetings to the diary um which i find i just find them just something that i can't i can't get over and it it seems as though that's people are not necessarily thinking about, or even, I don't know, thinking that asynchronous work can be easily adopted. Is it something that can be easily adapted? I know you said that each, each team and each business has, has to have its own way and its own way of working, but how easy, oh, actually that's a difficult question to answer. Instead of that, I'll, I'll ask you, how should leaders uh, approach trying to address an over-dependence on meetings? Uh, stop having meetings. Uh, that's the trick. Stop having meetings and just try to write things to each other. That's it. There's nothing more to it. That's the whole secret. It's just stop having those meetings. Like, Just consider for a moment, do we need to have this meeting? Is this valuable to have? Like, And there's a few very simple rules you can follow. One, are you just sharing information? Don't have the meeting. No point to have a meeting at all. Just massive overhead and then delaying particular kind of information. Uh, rule number two, if you have a meeting, make sure it has a clear agenda. Everybody has seen it in advance and everybody contributes to it. Um, and then you can just add on top of that a million different things just for meetings by itself. But like the, if, you, if you say, well, we want to stop over relying on, on meetings, I'd stop having those meetings and like find other ways. You will, like, you will literally be forced to find other ways to communicate with each other. And if you're remote, and especially if you're distributed, so you're not all working at the same time, then that other ways means you have to write stuff down somewhere or record it, right? Like speak it into the air or into a long video or whatever else. Um, and the moment you do that, you are working asynchronously, right? It's like, there's a trap you can fall into, which is to say, well, we're going to stop having meetings. But now we're just all chatting on Slack all the time. And everybody's expected to be online at the same time because we are really bad at sharing information. Um, and I think that's actually likely that you're going to fall into the trap if you're just immediately going to stop having meetings. But if you think about for a few minutes, what if we write things down in a place where they belong in appropriate context and make it so that they are non-ephemeral, right? Slack being ephemeral, the messages disappear essentially once they're out of sight. And then we put things in a Notion page or in our project management tool or whatever else. Um, yeah, you're going to, you're working asynchronously. That's it. That's the solution. Nobody wants to be in meetings all day. And like the few times that you are in meetings, you should spend that time, you know, enjoying seeing each other and having an interesting conversation like we are. But um, yeah, so yeah, how to address it, stop having those meetings and then figure out other ways, create a single source of truth for all information and write stuff down there. Mm -hmm. And I know you said write things down on lots of other, well, I say lots, but people are adopting things like, um, you know, video, short form videos and short form even audios now is, is something that's, that's, that's pretty big. Yeah. Do you do that as well, or are you mainly written form within uh, remote? No, I, uh, you know, different different media for different um, purposes. And I, 
the nice thing about text is it's easy to search through and easy to structure, whereas you cannot easily structure video or uh, audio. And, and luckily, Loom and like Yak and such, they now have transcripts, which are okay, not great, but they're okay. Um, and some of them you can search. So that, that helps. But you, you need to have some sort of like central place where you report your documentation, your information. And that central place can be different for different projects. You might want to have one for the whole company, for example, but then for different projects, it could be you know a particular project management tool or whatever else. But um, writing things down is nice because it makes things easy to find. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, agreed. And to, I mean, uh, I think we've covered async, obviously we've just done an overview, but and a lot, I really like your simplistic, not simplistic, but your straightforward, that's the word, straightforward, um view on that and i think maybe i, I guess maybe people are just overcomplicating things um <laughs> really, maybe if i'm oversimplifying things i i think it's a bit of both you think well i, I well I, I do think that people like you said if there's no point having if people are just sort of creating meetings just for the sake of creating a meeting then then why is it there in the first place but um no, it's, it's good to hear that. But what I wanted to ask next is really what's what's in store for for remote going forward? What's the, what does the future look like? Um, and also from your perspective, you've you obviously your father, you've recently had a second addition to your family. What what's the what's in store for you personally as well? Well, no more kids, Alex. That's, <laughs> that's we're done with the kids. Two kids is, is a lot. Um, very happy with them, but no more. No, it, look, remote's doing really well as a company. We, you know, we do a few things, but our ambitions are far greater than that. So a lot of exciting things to to come out, uh, most of them next year, uh, as the year is ending now. Yeah, for me personally, it's it's doing that. I'm just enjoying my family. Like, <laughs> I think uh, we're really ambitious with what we're doing with remote. I, it doesn't it doesn't nearly feel like we are like have arrived to where we want to be we have a really long path to go um, so there's there's a lot to do well as a fellow fellow dad myself i've got three kids um you're you're dealing with different time zones different you know you, you're in portugal right and then you've got people in the u.s who you've got people well all over the, all over the world how i mean a big part of my audience are people who are parents who are probably working from home for sometimes. What would be your biggest uh, piece of advice? Obviously, you've got to be organized. I, mean, I think everybody would say that, but what, what is your biggest piece of advice for people who are trying to, to find a balance with, with work and, and, and home life? And what would you say? Um, I would say prioritize what is important, which is your family. Uh, your kids won't give a shit about what you did in your life um, in, in terms of work, whether you were successful or not, whether you were the best or not. So uh, pri prioritize your family. That's a regret you'll never have. Um, and that's it. Like I, I actually live in the Netherlands right now. One of the reasons we moved is to be close to my parents. And that's one of the best things i've ever done like so my kids can enjoy their grandparents and it's really really nice um and so i prioritize that they didn't move if it was for remote maybe i would have moved to the us where many of our customers are um that's not the choice i wanted to make i would be a terrible leader if i was very unhappy um, and I, I would be unhappy if i couldn't spend time with my kids and if we couldn't prioritize them and so that's it and how do you prioritize when you have like a lot of work going on and you can work 24 7 it's by aggressively prioritizing block time for your family so that your work doesn't interfere put away your phone or make sure that you know your phone is um uh you don't have your work work applications on your phone for example so that there's no there's no work calling you while you're with your family i think that is a easy trick but an important one it's been great finally to uh, to have you on the podcast and I for one will be keeping an eye on what uh, remote is doing for the future and yeah you, you're welcome to join us again any any time and you know you, you said you've got some things in store for 2022 which uh, 
we'd love to hear from you again <laughs> 2022 just to hear what those updates are but sure. for now um you thank you so much for joining us on the podcast thanks alex <laughs>